Good afternoon, and welcome to Biodiversity Data and Methods Now and Into the Future. My name is Kathy Gooden. I'm the Vice President for the Data and Methods Division at NatureServe. Uh, before we get started, there are a few instructions about how to make the best use of our digital platform for this session. Uh, first, I'd like to remind you that this session is being recorded. The public chat feature can be used to provide comments and thoughts or feedback during the session. And I'd encourage you all to introduce yourself using the chat. Uh, please put in your name, your organization, and where you're joining from. We can see who's here. Uh, there's a private chat to start a conversation with uh, one or more participants during the session. We're gonna keep the questions to the very end of the session. So you can use the Q&A feature at any time though to submit questions to the speakers and moderators. If you would please indicate who the question for was, who is for, that would really help me. Um, and you'll see in the upper corner of the Q&A box that you will see a little icon and that will allow you to upvote a question if there's one that you wanna make sure that we get to. Uh, majority is gonna rule here unless I see one that I really like. Uh, you can take notes directly, directly in the digital platform by toggling the notes tab and any notes you take during the session will be emailed to you automatically when it, the session's over. How cool is that? Uh, and if you have any technical issues during the event, please quick, click the request support link on the screen to be connected with a digital tech support. Okay, housekeeping over. I'm so pleased to moderate this session where our speakers will highlight some of the directions that the NatureServe network is headed to improve the ways that we collect and aggregate analyze, visualize, and deliver the critical date data on species and ecosystems to support conservation and management decisions. I wanna thank all of our speakers for bringing us some really exciting topics. We'll kick off today with Dr. Healy Hamilton, NatureServe's Chief Scientist, and Dr. Bruce Young, NatureServe's Chief Zoologist, who will share some of the hot off the press analyses of NatureServe network data that showcase our current capacity to report on patterns of biodiversity, imperilment threats, and protection status in the United States. Then Regan Smythe, Director of Spatial Analysis for NatureServe, and Dr. Todd, Todd jones Ferrand, who's the At-Risk Species Science Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Southeast Region, will describe advancements in the mapping of at-risk biodiversity, showcasing how NatureServe Network is working to supplement our data on known occurrences of at-risk species with information on likely and potential habitat and sharing case study on how these data are being put to work uh, to support species status assessments and sustainable management of species of greatest cons conservation need in the Southeast. Those of us that struggle to assemble spatial data sets from multiple sources know that one of the major obstacles is trying to reconcile species taxonomy. Today, Dr. Ann Francis, NatureServe's lead botanist, Leah Oliver, a senior research botanist at NatureServe, and Dr. Beckett Sterner, assistant professor at the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University, will share a pilot study that demonstrates why taxonomy matters when assessing conservation status and propose cutting edge tools that use AI to help with taxonomic reconciliation. And then finally, we'll be really looking into the future as Dr. Christine Pickens, science director at Unique Places to Save, and Derek Allen Rowe, the AR VR producer and at Wild Eyes will show us some amazing virtual reality visualizations of longleaf pine ecosystems and the associated species. And they're gonna discuss their vision for developing an asset certification program to advance conservation and restoration of the natural world through immersive technology. That's a big, exciting uh, slate of speakers today. I wanna to thank all of our speakers. I'm really excited about this. And with that, we'll get things started with Healy and Bruce. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, welcome to the 2021 virtual gathering of this extended community. Dr. Bruce Young and I are very grateful for this opportunity to share with you one of the many exciting initiatives that you're gonna hear about over the next few days uh, that are underway in the network. So this presentation is very much a work in progress. This is not yet a finished product. In fact, we've only been working on it for a couple months. Uh, so as with many other initiatives underway, this effort, which is to develop and visualize and communicate the current status of biodiversity in the US, it seeks to leverage the unique data of our network 
to provide meaningful and accessible summaries of biodiversity status and trends that are only possible because of our shared history, our shared data standards, and our shared commitment to unlocking the power of science for biodiversity conservation. So Bruce and I would like to thank the many colleagues in Nature Serve Science Division that have contributed to the synthesis, uh, which outwit, uh, and it would not be possible without the data from across the network. Next slide, please, Bruce. So there are many questions about biodiversity and its conservation in our country. So where do people go for answers? Like nature serve is uniquely positioned to answer these kinds of fundamental questions with the best available nationally consistent information. And we believe that there are an increasing array of audiences that are posing questions like this. And we want the nature serve network to be where all those audiences can readily find comprehensive and up-to-date answers that they can trust. Next slide, please, Bruce. So where exactly do people turn when they want answers to such fundamental questions about biodiversity in our country? Well, for the longest time, it's been Precious Heritage as the source, which was published 21 years ago using data that was collected a few years before that. And we know the status of biodiversity has changed. Our data has grown. Many additional relevant analyses have been conducted, but those results are often um, sort of scattered in various project reports and not that easy to find. In the intervening years, there's been a couple of attempts to provide updates like this. There was a, a state of the states effort and a species report card effort, uh, but nothing that's been updated in the last 15 years. And so with improvements that, the, that NatureServe and the network have been investing in the data exchange process, NatureServe network data has, we, we've never had more comprehensive or current data than we do today. And as you'll hear later in this um, session, we've made enormous advances in, in harmonizing taxonomy and in developing the taxonomy and distribution of vegetation assemblages. So we're really able now to assess both species and ecosystem status. Next slide, please, Bruce. So for this effort, we are focused on the United States. So Canada already has an excellent species and ecosystem status reporting system. We've seen reports come out of Canada, such as our home and native land, or more recently on guard for them. The Canadian government is supporting efforts right now to apply those data to identify Canada's key biodiversity areas and meet other national conservation goals. So this particular effort is focused on the US. So today we're pretty happy to share some very early draft results of this report that we hope to now produce every year annually. So the status of biodiversity in the US. And another reason that we're focused on the US is because there are policy initiatives underway that are gonna truly benefit from this national summary view of NatureServe network data, uh, such as the next round of state wildlife action plans that are looking for a more landscape scale perspective or the Biden administration's goals for 30 by 30. And so to address those needs and related needs and to strengthen our position, the NatureServe network's position as the source for biodiversity status information in the US, we are producing this report and setting it up to be reproduced annually. So um, we've just compiled the core data for this analysis. We're working now on data visualization. Then we'll turn to the design of the report. So you're really seeing something um, that is in process. And to look at where we stand in this process, I'm gonna pass it off to Bruce Young, our chief zoologist, uh, to, to take you into some of the draft content. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Healy. Um, yes, let's dive into the content of the report. Um, the actual report will attempt to answer five questions, and each of these questions are key areas where NatureServe is uniquely positioned to provide answers. 
And for each of these questions, uh, we have results for both species and ecosystems. Um, but here for the sake of time, um, we can only show partial results for some of those things. So these questions um, are what are the patterns of biodiversity? What proportion of biodiversity is at risk? Where are at-risk species and ecosystems located? What are the threats to biodiversity? And what is the protection status of at-risk biodiversity? Look at the, um, okay, so here's the first question. Where is biodiversity distributed? Um, so as Healy said, these are, these are fresh um, analyses. We're probably gonna work on some visualization uh, in the future, but here you get a, a, a quick early look um, and look, this is patterns of biodiversity in plants and animals across the United States. That's remarkably similar when, when you roll them all up um, to this level. Um, but note um, for the animals, of course, there's way more than 10,734 species of animals in the United States. Um, this analysis is just for those groups for which we have comprehensive information. And by that, I mean, we have complete state distribution of the species and uh, global ranks for each of the species. Uh, we can also dive into particular groups um, to show interesting patterns. Here's here are two groups of uh, high management interest, cacti and orchids, of course, um, many uh, conservation issues with both of these species. Uh, and of course, um, a strength of nature serves data is that it is best for groups that are under current management concern. Uh, as I said, we cover uh, these questions for both species and ecosystems. Um, so here we see the distribution at the subclass level for the National Ve Vegetation Classification System. Nature Service worked closely with several major federal resource management agencies to develop this NVC system. Because the NVC and Nature Service ecological systems are now both fully integrated into the U.S. Land Fire National Mapping Program, we can now characterize both the current and historical extent of NBC systems at the group level. This map shows where these subclasses are located uh, and note that the converted ecosystems are showing up in light gray. Uh, let's go on to the next question. Um, what proportion of biodiversity is at risk? Um, here you can uh, see overall, um, for the US, for all the species that we're looking at, 34%, a third of species are at risk. And what do we mean by at risk? Uh, we're talking here about the species that are um, GH, G1, G2, G3. So that's everything from um, only known historically to critically imperiled, imperiled, and, and vulnerable. Uh, and uh, note here too, that the uh, width of the bars is proportional to the number of species in each of the groups. Uh, and you can, you can look down and see the uh, percentages that are threatened um, across these groups. All animals that we happen to track are slightly more threatened than plants. And then within animals, the invertebrate groups uh, that we track are uh, far more threatened than the vertebrates. Uh, the next question is where are at-risk species and ecosystems located? Um, here we're answering uh, this question at the ecosystem level. The red on this map shows where NBC groups have been ranked as at risk of ecological collapse. A huge area of the country has already been completely transformed. That's the dark gray. The lighter, lighter gray is where ecosystems are less at risk. So here we see a spectrum of management needs from light gray to red to dark gray. The light gray is where we need to manage for uh, persistence. The red is where we have the opportunity to prevent ecosystem collapse if we act quickly. And the dark is where dark gray is where restoration is the only avenue left for us. So this gives this analysis gives us a roadmap for natural ecosystem management. Here we can dive deeper um, into one vegetation subclass, in this case, grasslands and shrublands. Here you can see uh, really highlighted for this group um, the extent of converted and at-risk uh, grass grasslands showing how they're one of the most threatened ecosystems in the United States. Uh, moving on, um, uh, we can now look at the factors causing imperilment in plants and animals. Again, only NatureServe has information at such a comprehensive level for US plants and animals. 
This analysis is limited to species ranked G1 or G2, what we call imperiled. So you can see similarities in plants and animal that both are heavily threatened by agriculture and urban development. Uh, but for animals, uh, many more species are threatened by pollution and climate change than for plants. Whereas on the plant side, many more species are threatened by invasive species and human intrusion. In this case, it's mostly um, from recreational activities. Uh, now, our last question is, uh, what is the protection, of, protection status of at-risk biodiversity? And here we're looking at this at the ecosystem level. This analysis gives you a view of how well our native ecosystems are covered by existing protected areas. You can see again, especially those prairie grasslands are, are, are not, not very well uh, protected. And also in the Southeast, the Appalachian Piedmont um, are, are very poorly protected. And protection coverage, um, as many of us know, is much greater in the West uh, than it is in the East. Finally, um, the end of the report, we have an appendix with all the numbers. So if you need to know the precise nitty gritty details, we have you covered. For example, you might need to cite the percent of bees or the percent of warm deserts that are at risk for, um, of, of extinction or extirpation um, for a policy statement or a grant proposal or report or something like that. You can get those up-to-date numbers uh, right here uh, every year. So what, what have we learned since Precious Heritage came out? Well, we have a couple of highlights, both in terms of data coverage and then what's really going on with biodiversity. First, uh, we have far more extensive ecosystem data. All that MDC work um, has advanced tremendously in the last two decades. We've tripled our coverage of invertebrates to nearly 8,000 species in comprehensively assessed groups. We have data for many more species, but they're not in comprehensively assessed groups. We have more transparent ranking methods with the rank calculator that we're using across the network. Uh, we have data for non-vascular plants that we didn't have in the past. Um, we've more than doubled the number of mapped occurrences we have of at-risk uh, 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 species and ecosystem. These are the um, element occurrence locations that are mapped by the natural heritage programs. And th these numbers just reflect those in the last three years. And then in terms of changes over time, the major threat to biodiversity is still habitat loss through uh, various ways. But we've noticed that fewer species today are threatened by over-exploitation. That means efforts to control take on sensitive species have been successful. Uh, fewer species are, are, are threatened that way. But on the other hand, climate change wasn't even mentioned uh, in Pre Precious Heritage as a, as a, as a countable threat uh, to mm -hmm. particular species. Whereas here, um, whereas now we know that's quite an important uh, threat. So next steps, uh, we're gonna improve visualizations, finalize the text, release the report and some accompanying story map and other things. The release will come in a few months. And then we're gonna do it again in 2022 and again after that. We hope this report will fill an important need in our community and serve to raise awareness about NatureServe's data holdings and analytical capabilities. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to your comments, either here in the chat, or don't hesitate to contact Helioride directly um, via email. Thank you. Hello, I'm Regan Smythe. Um, I'm following up on, on Bruce and Healy's great talk by, by digging in a little bit on some of the data that makes those analyses possible. So we just saw a great presentation on some of the patterns in biodiversity, um, but now we're gonna step back a little bit and, and dig in on where that information comes from, how NatureServe has been approaching spatial data in the past and some of the new directions we're going in because there, there really are some exciting developments underway with how we're mapping not just observations, but also thinking a little broader and including our uh, habitat models and range maps when we think about biodiversity location data. 
I'm joined today with Dr. Todd jones Farron from the Fish and Wildlife Service. He'll be drilling in a little bit further on the habitat models um, as part of our spatial data model and addressing how they're being applied in the Southeast to address real conservation needs, as well as some of the barriers to fully maximizing and understanding how to use these new spatial data products. Uh, I should mention this is really focused on species. Uh, we're thinking in many of the same ways about an expanded model for ecosystem data. You just saw some great ecosystem maps in the, the last presentation, but we'll save that for next year. Um, so I wanted to start off with this map. Um, this really is an amazing map if you step back and think about what it represents. What you're looking at is 50 years of natural heritage data. Each of these blue dots represents a documented occurrence um, that has been recorded somewhere across the NatureServe network in the US and Canada for one of the species we track. Here's a slightly different version of this map. that map. Um, this is just showing the, those same records, but just filtering for globally imperiled or federally listed species. This is cool, right? It's, it's cool blue dots on a map, but when you think about what's behind it, it really is quite amazing. I mean, this is our, our natural heritage. Those dots represent species like this, the Wilson Creek cartleaf, which is uh, was recognized as a species just in 2017. There's two populations known on the Blue Ridge Escarpment. The map covers imperiled invertebrates that nobody else is comprehensively tracking. You know, without the data that the NatureServe network maintains, we wouldn't be able to assess the conservation status of the Carter blue butterfly or other imperiled pollinators like it. And those data points cover some of the species that everybody kind of finds adorable and, and cares about as well, like the pygmy rabbit. Together, that's it, right? Like that's the world out of our Zoom windows. Those are the imperiled elements of biodiversity that without conservation action, we're not going to have anymore. And it's, you know, the reason why we're all at this conference today. The other thing I love about this map is that these dots represent the collective work of a group of really devoted conservation professionals. So you know what you're what you're seeing is the collective effort of field botanists and zoologists across the the network who are out there in dirty boots getting their bodies covered in seed ticks to collect information on elements of biodiversity the map represents the collective effort of the data managers who deal with a different kind of bug but kind of trying to harmonize and bring all that information together to curate that information and this map represents the collective effort of program managers across our network who work together to overcome programmatic barriers so that this data can be shared freely and really come together into this multi-jurisdictional picture of what's out there in the natural world. And this really matters. It's through this information and products we derive from it that we're able to tell the Pew Charitable Trust to help them figure out which river systems they should be investing in for conservation. This information is used by the federal government, by the BLM and DOD to understand what species they should be paying attention to and where they're located. This information is used in environmental review tools, it's used by industry, it's used by the Sustainable Forestry Initiative to understand how their su sustainable management practices are impacting biodiversity. Without these collective mapped products, we are unable to, to answer the, the pressing conservation needs of today. So this is great. You can probably tell I love this map, um, but it has some real shortcomings as well. And the biggest one is that this is a map of inventory, right? So it's places we've been able to be. And despite all the wonderful people in our network, we know we can't be everywhere. And so a big part of our spatial data strategy today is figuring out how we can use, you know, the technology of this, this century to tap into collaborative science and to use predictive modeling to fill in some of the blank spaces on the map. Um, this is one way we're doing that. Uh, the, the example on the screen now is using range maps. This is from NatureServe Canada, who has this great ecosystem-based range mapping program. There's a presentation on it on Wednesday, but it's how they're approaching filling in the blank places. 
using documented occurrence data, using expertise, um, you know, they're mapping out not just where species have been observed, but where they're likely to occur. This is fantastic. It's a really neat per project, um, but it also has limitations. We know this bumblebee is not going to be everywhere within these ecoregions. Um, it's well, the documented occurrence data kind of underrepresents habitats. Range map products like this, well, fantastic, really overrepresent. Um, they they show too much area, which can make it hard to target conservation. So the third rung of our spatial data strategy for species is something that kind of falls in between, and that's species habitat models. Um, if you've been around NatureServe for a while, you've heard us talking a lot about this, but the basic idea is taking that occurrence information, intersecting it with data layers that characterize the environment, and using that to build predictive models of where else you have similar conditions on the landscape that, um, lead to, to habitat for that particular species. This is an example for the frosted flatwood salamander um, in the southeast. This is taking that predictive habitat surface, just thresholding it to identify areas of medium and high suitability habitat. Now we can kind of get to that intermediate between we know it's there or we think it's in this broad area to these are the other places a species is likely to occur. So over the past couple of years, we've, we've really been working hard to do this. Um, this is looking at six species, uh, just a representation of some of the species we tracked showing those documented occurrence data, the blue dots from the first map. Um, fantastic, but as you can see, there's a lot of black on this map. This is data for the same species, but no, now showing habitat models. What we've been able to do with the map of biodiversity importance and other projects over the past few years is start to really comprehensively build a library of habitat model products. Um, with projects like the ecosystem-based range maps and some other big range map modeling efforts, we're doing similar things with range maps. So for both species models and range maps, we're building these comprehensive libraries that can be used in conjunction with documented occurrences to really help target conservation efforts, even in places that haven't been comprehensively surveyed. A lot of work is going on right now in figuring out how to bring this data together in much the same way as we do for documented occurrences. So how do we have model, have a standard for habitat model products, have technology to support that information all flowing together? Um, if you're interested in that, we have several other sessions that talk, touch on it. Um, the habitat model data standard is one of them, um, but something we're thinking heavily about. And then we're also thinking heavily about how do we then take those different kinds of biodiversity location data and bring them together in standard products. So our vision and what we're, we're working towards soon is, you know, a nature serve explorer that would show not just conservation status and documented distribution, but the likely distribution of species based on habitat models or potential distribution based on range. Uh, Lori Scott's going to give a presentation later today about plans for nature serve explorer pro and what this expanded spatial data model um, would look like in that context. This is all, you know, I'm very excited about where we're going with all of this. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that as we move towards these new spatial data products, particularly habitat models, there's a lot of work to do in thinking about how we communicate them and help the people who use our data know how to apply them in ways that make sense. Habitat models at their essence are just hypotheses of habitat. Some are better than others. They can be iterated and improved over time. Um, so we're doing a lot of thinking about how do you communicate model confidence? What are appropriate end uses? And with that, I think I'll hand it over to Todd um, because he's going to, to talk in a bit more detail about what that actually looks like on the ground. So thank right, you very thank much. You, thank you, Regan. Uh, so Regan has kind of laid out the, the case for species habitat models, but I wanna build on that just a little bit and talk about the promise of, of species habitat models. They hold great promise for collaborative decision-making. 
And, you know, there's only the species with the narrowest ranges can be conserved by a single organization. To be successful, we must collaborate at broader and broader scales. Landscape and regional conservation partnerships, such as the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy, which is pictured here on the right, are popping up across the country. And with the new administration and their focus on climate change and 30 by 30, collaborative decision-making for conservation is becoming all the more relevant. Models can help in that range because it can help us with consistency of decision inputs. When we have range-wide consistent models for species that people are bought into, they can, working from the same data is gonna, is gonna help us be much more efficient. And the reason we need that is because our decisions really have consequences. They have consequences to the, to the species, they have consequences to people. And so we need to make uh, sure that the models are, are relevant. They have, they have decision quality as Regan was just saying. Next slide. Uh, another area where uh, habitat models hold a lot of, of promise is as learning platforms. As Regan said, they are hypotheses about how the species responds to these environmental conditions. And so by building a model, we have a framework for that information to go when it's collected. Right now, that, collect, that information is in gray literature and, and published literature and maybe in somebody's file drawer. Models give us a place to accumulate that information and update it with additional data over time and additional ideas. And we need this because our understanding is really insufficient. Uh, we don't know a lot about a lot of these species. We don't know enough about them. We need ways to learn faster. Next. Uh, but this comes at a challenge, right? There's, there's a catch, because there's always a catch. Uh, collaborative conservation is tricky because it requires time, talent, treasure, and trust, all of which we have in very short supply. Even among uh, trust among conservation organizations isn't all that high. Uh, models can help with this because they give us a consistent co-production process. People come together, they have uh, defined roles and responsibilities relative to data management and information exchange that helps us all understand the data and interpret it in the same way. And we need this because our current methods are really inefficient. It takes uh, way too long to, to gather this data and assemble it to do a, uh, a species status assessment for the service. We don't talk about things in the same way uh, and oftentimes it's because the scale of our partnerships don't match the scale of the decisions and there's a, an area that we need to work in. Next. And so that's really where we're trying to get to with this collaborative uh, distribution modeling project in the Southeast. We're trying to get to these decision quality models by getting the main actors, the refuge system, ecological services, the folks who make the ESA listing decision, the state agencies, which are, are tasked with managing for these, pro, for these species, and the heritage network, as represented here by NatureServe, getting all these people talking together so that they understand these, the, the data, how to interpret it, what you can do, how good of the model is, is all improving. Uh, and you would be surprised uh, how little actually the refuge system and ES, even though they're in the same organization, actually talk to each other on a regular basis. Uh, so the more we can do this kind of stuff, the better. Next. Uh, so like any project, you've got different groups. They're going to have different lists of priority species. So that's where we had to start. Uh, we started off with nearly 2000 species, cut it down to about 131 candidate species. And then we started to filtering those by how soon do we have to make a decision? How important of a role does refuge, do refuges play in that? And what's the conservation urgency? Looking at things like Bruce was talking about, the, the ecosystem imperilment and, and other factors like that. So we got ourselves down to 27 species that we're currently working on. Next. Uh, as, a, as a bit of an aside, even that gathering and everybody getting around the table and talking about the list of species and looking at what data is available uncovered some things that we needed to know like 
how many of these species shown here in the purple and red lines that have more than 15 years or we don't know when the last S rank was done. There's a lot of these species for which we need additional information to make decisions. Next. And in terms of making decisions, USGS and NatureServe and others have developed a rubric for assessing how appropriate the models are for decision making, kind of a stoplight approach. Next. Uh, and with this stoplight approach, we've started thinking about, okay, what is an ex what's the right collection of, of characteristics if we want to use this model for guiding surveys? So uh, level one, this, this first species doesn't meet level one because it hasn't had enough review. Uh, the second species meets level one, but it could meet level two if it had more, more review. So we're using this as a way not only to look at, you know, how good the model is for a particular decision, but what is it we need to focus on to improve that model? For most species, uh, especially in the MOBI models, it's really just about more review. Next. So we're taking that review to our broad partnership. We're looking for folks inside uh, the the heritage network as well as outside. How many people can we get from academia, from, from the service, from other partners that we have on the ground to review these models and help us generate the broadest sense of awareness of the model and consensus to its accuracy and its proper use as possible. Next. Uh, so finally, I want to say that these models have great promise for generating better conservation outcomes. In the Southeast, we're trying to build a network of lands and waters capable of sustaining biodiversity, but that really requires a very strong network of partners to make that happen. Models can help strengthen the partnership because it's a mechanism for building efficiencies in data sharing and information management, building efficiencies in research and survey design, and building trust among partners. Uh, and this is really important because the fate of the world is literally in our hands. Uh, models will tend to increase the transparency, repeatability, and defensibility of our decisions. And the more that we can work together, uh, on these types of tools, the more we're going to generate that trust. And I encourage you, as you go forth to save the world, to engage as broad, as, as broad a set of partners and potential partners, folks like DOT and, and other folks you might not normally work with, get as many people at the table as you, can re as you reasonably can. Uh, the more that we can mainstream this kind of collaborative learning and decision support uh, tool generation, the more effective that we can be at sustaining species for the long haul. And with that, I'll say thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Anne Francis. I'm the lead botanist at NatureServe. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here today joining this group of awesome talks. I'm seeing a lot of common themes emerge. Um, today I will be introducing a talk that will be given by Leah Oliver and Beckett Sterner and um, it is about taxonomy. So whether you love taxonomy or love to hate taxonomy, you know that it is an integral part of our work. Next slide, please, Leo. So as conservation practitioners, uh, we're well versed in the data needed to save species. And we like to frame this as a series of questions, starting with what is it, going to where is it, how is it doing, and how do we protect it? And Leah, if you could click. Um, so this talk focuses on uh, can you go back one slide? Yeah, there we go. This talk focuses on taxonomy, but I'm excited to present novel ways that we're rethinking taxonomy, including how it relates to spatial data and conservation status. Next slide, please. Um, 
So although taxonomy has been part of natural history and biological sciences since their inception, debates about taxonomy, especially vis-a-vis -vis conservation, are very much still part of our current dialogue as um, seen by a snapshot of publications that have come out in the last few years. Next slide. So why do we, why are we still talking about taxonomy and why do we need new approaches? Um, there are a few reasons that we need to tame the taxonomic beast. Um, Leah, can you go to the next slide? Not advancing. It's not advancing? No. Okay, well, I will just keep on talking while we wait for it to advance. Um, um, the next slide, when we see it, shows um, on the left some of our grand challenges um, in taxonomy, and on the right, some of the ideas and ways that we're thinking about, there we go, um, moving forward. So, um, one of the reasons why we need a new approach is that the way that we do taxonomic updates is quite labor intensive. It often involves doing manual crosswalks, numerous Excel spreadsheets, um, and this is just not sustainable given the number of species that we're trying to conserve. So we need to harness advances in technology to make our process more efficient and where possible automated. Um, secondly, we often deal with the pressure to adhere to only one taxonomic view. Um, and it's true that sometimes we do need a unified list, but as conservation practitioners, we also have to be able to scale, for example, a global checklist to our jurisdiction that we work in. Um, and sometimes we need to modify that list to include laws, policies, and other considerations um, in our work. So a top-down approach um, can often feel like a forced consensus. Um, it, it sometimes ignores important local knowledge and it puts the onus of taxonomic alignment back on the conservation practitioner. Um, a third reason for needing a new approach is that standards for taxonomic alignment have yet to be fully incorporated into global frameworks like the Darwin Core. So while big aggregated data sets like GBIF have become absolutely essential to our work, they kind of come with a buyer beware sign um, in that um, it, it le they leave users to figure out complicated data sets. And sometimes errors are introduced um, unbeknownst to, um, to people using the data um, or analyzing it. Finally, um, many of our taxonomic updates are done on an ad hoc manner. So by that, I mean, um, we uh, a, a paper comes out, it's published, we align it with other treatments, we update our database, and then we just move on. Um, and those decisions and changes in alignment, while they're important, implicit in our database, they're not recorded in a way for them to be used by others um, or repeated. So um, I've laid out these grand challenges um, and now I'm very excited to give the floor over to Leah Oliver, who will um, further illustrate some of these points using um, a case study of Trillium and Beckett Sterner, who will present a vision for using data intelligence to advance this important issue. Leah? Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about how taxonomy affects conservation status assessments through the lens of this little tiny flower. This is the least trillium. It's a tiny spring wildflower that has a really long taxonomy, taxonomic history, um, mostly due to observation through the field. And the diagram that makes up most of this screen is what we would call a taxonomic alignment. Each of the colors represent a different taxonomic treatment and the little dashed lines between each of the uh, rectangles tells you the relationship um, between those. And you'll see there's equals, greater than, less than signs. Okay, so then we have Nature Serves Conservation Status Ranks down at the bottom right. These are used to answer fundamental questions like how is it doing? But how in the world can you possibly answer this question when the what is it looks like this? This is Trillium pusillum. 
It can either be viewed as one species with two varieties, if you follow flora North America, or it can be 10 different distinct species if you follow a newer treatment. This is a treatment table where we have aligned the taxonomies for four different treatments. Each scientific name is given a different color in this table and each cell size represents or is a proxy for the size of the circumscription. So if you take a look at either the name Pusillum or the name Virginianum, you can see that as you move left to right on the table, that the size of the cell grows larger. That means that the circumscription is changing from treatment to treatment, even though the name is not. Imagine for a minute that you had a stack of specimens um, and you want to be thinking about this in terms of like Ikea shelving. Think for a moment that each of these is a shelving unit type. And one day you decide that you want to take your shelving unit that's set up like the Cartes treatment and you want to move it to the floor North America treatment. If you did this, you would want to take your stack of specimens under the orange Trillium Texanum and variety Ozarcane in the dark green and move them over to Flora North America's shelf for variety Pusillum. So this essentially is a greater than relationship. We are taking the two taxa from Cartes and putting them on the shelf for variety Pusillum or lumping them. So this is explicitly defined as greater than. We go through this step for all of the taxa and all the treatments and ultimately come up with those symbols and the alignment. Okay, so this is the exciting part or part of it. After we determined all of the relationships for all of the taxonomic treatments, we used advanced reasoning logic um, to allow us to take a single set of occurrence points for the trillium pusillum complex and map them through the lens of each of these taxonomic treatments within a matter of minutes. These maps allowed us to calculate two basic metrics in conservation status ranking. That is the range extent and the area of occupancy. Okay. So we took those two metrics from these maps and the relationships, and we used the rank calculator to um, rank each of these species under different treatments. So Flora North America is on the left and Nature Serves treatment is on the right. And you'll see that Flora North America produced zero apparel taxa. Whereas nature serves treatment, there are two different um, species or taxa that are considered imperiled, variety monticulum and variety, or excuse me, Georgianum. Okay, now we're looking at Flora North America compared to farmer. Farmer is the treatment that recognizes 10 distinct taxa. And she, um, in her treatment, run through the calculator, produced um, five different imperiled taxa. So really the question is, what difference does this make? Well, if you were a land manager and you had, let's say Georgianum, Trillium Georgianum on your property, but you were using the Flora North America treatment, you may overlook the species entirely and report it either as secure at the species level or um, vulnerable at the variety level. And if you are a nature serve um, heritage botanist, you might simply use the um, farmer treatment because it shows the most variation. And um, especially if it were backed up by various genetic and morphologic studies. So how do we move forward from this? Well, we need to change our mindset about taxonomy, especially where species complexes are concerned, because we do have the ability to show where there is uncertainty in a clear way. We also need to make the data more transparent to data users and help them choose which taxonomic treatment is right for them, because taxonomy, taxonomy is similar to other types of data where it is fit for use. We also need to be able to show quickly the impacts of using different taxonomic treatments on the conservation status ranks.
And most importantly, we need to be able to accelerate the discovery and creation of these taxonomic alignments by, um, so all scientists can use these who are involved in conservation, ranking and prioritizing. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Beckett who's going to explain how we can scale up. All right, thanks Leah. Um, so yeah, I wanna pick up where, where Leah has, has um, brought us and say that this is sort of embodying a much uh, ge more general and, and broad issue of um, not just uh, what's going on with the Trillium case, but stakeholders reasonably preferring different taxonomies um, in other groups as well. You might want to be on the cutting edge. You might want to be conservative with respect to um, new research and taxonomy. You might prefer salience to uh, conservation action of the state, national, continental, or global scales. And those might have different suitabilities with respect to the taxonomic options available. So in order to deliver uh, taxonomically precise spatial data about where species are, um, we have some important obstacles there, right? We can't take for granted that it doesn't matter what the taxonomy is that you choose. Um, the concept I wanna introduce here um, that's sort of the linchpin for making this happen is what we're calling data intelligence. And what this does is provide information, kind of like an intelligence report about the alignment between multiple taxonomies. So how is a concept a name pair uh, related from one taxonomic treatment to the next, like Leo was showing in the grid uh, image earlier. And specifically, this is a, in machine readable uh, form as a mapping between names and their meanings uh, across classifications. And I just want to highlight briefly that this, you know, we're talking about species uh, data here in particular, um, but this also applies as well to vegetation classification systems or more broadly to other sorts of um, taxonomies uh, that, that we are interested in biodiversity. Next slide, please. Just having an issue advancing. So while the, the, the slide is moving forward, um, this data intelligence is uh, really serving as a means to, the, to an end here, uh, which is providing uh, novel and better or improved data services. Um, and so in particular, um, uh, a real aspirational goal here is to provide taxonomically precise uh, spatial uh, data about species. And so, for example, if you imagine going to GBIF um, and downloading a bunch of records, um, those might have scientific names associated with them, uh, but not according to any particular taxonomy. And depending on the distribution of, of who uploaded those records and under what concepts, um, you may or may not be getting a, a biologically coherent view of the group. So a key goal here is to take a data set um, that has names, but not according to a coherent taxonomy. There we go. And um, provide the correct concept labels uh, for the user's preferred specified taxonomic treatment. Um, and uh, in, in addition to explicitly represent taxonomic ambiguity for these observations, um, did it come from this taxonomy or this taxonomy um, by listing um, the potentially correct concept labels on the target preferred taxonomy that are, that are consistent with the, the data that we're looking at. Um, so if we're not sure which concept on the, the target taxonomy is correct, uh, to give a list of alternatives rather than to simply uh, say nothing um, or to pick one uh, when it, it's not fully uh, confident. All right, next slide. So if that's the sort of aspirational vision of what we could try and do with taxonomically precise data aggregation, um, data intelligence is key to that because we have to be able to map uh, records with uh, different taxonomic treatments or uh, ambiguous treatments onto the preferred taxonomy. But of course, that presupposes that we have all of those alignments available in the first place. Um, and uh, what we saw with Leah's work is that it, it's um, being done and people do it every time you, you, you create uh, the high quality data sets for conservation use, um, but it's not necessarily shared and reused or done in a way that um, you know, can have some of the analogous standards to the red light, yellow light, green light um, that the, the previous talk was, was addressing for the uh, niche models. And so uh, to make the sort of uh, taxonomically precise data aggregation that we're aiming for possible on a larger scale, um, we really need innovative infrastructure behind it. And in particular, that can complete this feedback loop between people building and curating alignment information in distributed places and projects, um, reusing that information, disseminating it across different groups, 
uh, supporting novel research services, and in turn, whose applications feed back into uh, yet again improved understanding of the relationships between taxonomies. So this is the closing this feedback loop uh, is what we need the infrastructure to do. And it's both a social and a technological problem. Um, so next slide, please. And uh, what we're going to present by way of closing uh, is a, a vision for uh, uh, infrastructure system that could help uh, realize that. And so sorry, Beckett, I'm trying to. Sure. Um, what we can imagine here is that there is a you know, really diverse group of stakeholders uh, to uh, this problem. There's the folks that really just want the data aggregation, please. I, I don't want to know about what's going on under the hood. Uh, there's the folks that are really into advancing the systematics research and are uh, helping us discover and, and determine exactly how different taxonomies are related. Um, and then there's the data managers who are responsible for keeping all of the pooled information alive and going here. And so um, if we start on the right, uh, the uh, right-hand box here uh, in the green uh, symbolizes the, the data services that we'd like to provide. Um, so to be able to query what's going on with the taxonomic names and concepts that I have in my data set, uh, to disambiguate them to a precise target taxonomy, and then to aggregate them um, uh, through translating them to the, the preferred taxonomy. Of course, that doesn't happen unless you have a repository and a way of exchanging information about the alignments, which is shown um, in the middle uh, cylinder here, the taxonomic alignment exchange services. And uh, you can't get the information into that repository unless you engage a different set of stakeholders on the left side to first produce and curate and maintain those, that alignment information. And so this is where some of the advanced logic reasoning um, comes in uh, that Leah was mentioning, how to accelerate the production of this uh, alignment information. Um, one more quick, Leah, just to get the last era there. Um, and uh, in addition, so if we have the folks that wanna use the data services, the folks whose research is driving forward um, the production of the alignment information, then there's also, um, for example, the data managers groups that would want to be able to pull that in and, and uh, query and update their own uh, databases with the latest alignment information. Um, so this is sort of the vision for where can we go from here. And it would really add a novel uh, component to the broader biodiversity data ecosystem, one that could advance uh, the goals that Anne had mentioned at the beginning in terms of accelerating uh, and, and reusing the work involved in the alignments um, really negating the need to arrive at a forced consensus if we can uh, map between classifications in this fashion, um, to advance global standards for how to propagate and share uh, information about uh, the relationships between taxonomies, and um, to really provide a more sophisticated and uh, detailed uh, set of versioning information and sort of uh, provenance information about what's going on under the hood when we need to get into the, the details of how, for example, nature service is, is advancing its own reference standard classification. All right, and I think with that, um, I just would like to acknowledge quickly um, support from the uh, ASU President Special Initiative Fund and an NSF research grant shown here. and also to some of our collaborators uh, at ASU, Nico Franz, Caleb Powell, and others. Good afternoon, I'm Christine Pickens with Unique Places to Save here with Derek Allen Rowe of Wild Eyes. And we're gonna be talking about AR and VR immersive technology potential for um, digital nature. So, Imagine with me for a moment that you could put on a headset and see the species you care about the most right in front of you and take that headset off and hand it to, let's say, a, um, a congressman or woman right in their office. And you could have full confidence that that digital asset really truly represented what, what you were there to advocate for. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Hey, all take it from here. Uh, we 
had I had been working in immersive media for about five or six years, um, starting with capturing the U.S. national parks um, for virtual reality, and had came back to North Carolina to exhibit that work and started working with all different kinds of museums and including um, beginning to work with unique places to save. And we decided to uh, bring all of the people together uh, to experience different types of mixed reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, because we received a grant from Epic Games to develop this proof of concept that we had about ecological visualization models in immersive media. And what we came out from all these uh, professionals in the museum world and the university world um, was that uh, we needed to focus on the longleaf pine. Uh, the longleaf pine is a North Carolina state tree. Um, it's a conservation priority. And it turns out it was pretty uh, conducive to the AR VR development because of the way that the trees grow up and leave this open space underneath. So uh, our methodologies worked really good for developing this out. But one of the things that does make it challenging is when you're creating 3D trees, all of those pine needles and all that variation was actually like a really big challenge for the technology. The stipulations of the grant, and this is something that you all might have heard of before, is we had to create this visualization model in Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine is a platform for creating virtual experiences. Um, if you've heard of Fortnite, um, the game that has swept the world created by Epic Games, that game is created in Unreal Engine. Um, it's a way to create experiences that involve lots of 3D models. And in this case, 3D models of natural um, assets or natural, natural 3D models, but also in a way that uses physics and lighting and reflection and all these elements that make it seem like an immersive real experience. And it puts all these elements like textures and rocks and plants together so that you feel like you're in a 3D world. Well, the first thing we did on this project was grab one of these, these trees that we could get from, let's say, an online marketplace or something like that. And they didn't have any longleaf pines, but they did have a Scots pine. So for one of our advisor meetings, we pulled the Scots pine into the uh, VR headset and allowed the scientists and experts to kind of like go up and look at it and walk around it. And they tore it apart. They were like, oh, this is really, you know, it's cool, it's cool. But, um, you know, if you look up at the bark, it's not, I don't, can't really tell what that is. These needles, they don't really, uh, they don't really look like uh, longleaf pine needles. And so we knew from then on that what we were gonna have to do is shift instead of from just making an experience, we needed to actually create the tree that could be used in the experience. And the goal was to create a longleaf pine, a 3D longleaf pine that had um, accurate pine needles, accurate pine cones, and photorealistic bark. Um, the scope was that it could be identified as a longleaf pine, as opposed to a loblolly pine or a Scots pine like we had originally started with. So the first thing we did is pull together a group of experts to help us do this, not just on the immersive side or Unreal Engine side, but also in the ecological side. Um, we had a longleaf pine expert, we had a grasslands expert, and each time we would review, uh, we would have these sort of virtual sessions kind of like this, our project would grow a little bit, you know, it would grow a little bit beyond that single tree or grow, the tree would change a little bit. And after six months of work, um, we were able to develop a virtual longleaf pine in um, Unreal Engine that was almost indiscernible from a photograph. So we started with the longleaf pine. And the idea is that what the question that started to come up for us is, well, what if what if we were to start to create these certified versions of these models? So when people like us are trying to create visualizations of their data, they will be able to have in confidence a certified tree or asset or plant. And we knew that we needed to grow beyond this because of our expert advisors. 
into ecologically certified natural communities. Christine, do you want to take over there? Yeah, sure, you can go to the next slide. Well, uh, so this actually in this slide, uh, we are showing that it could grow beyond plants and animals um, to entire communities, um, even included something like the red cockaded woodpecker. Um, we did a, a site visit um, at uh, one of our properties that we uh, partnered with the Longleaf Alliance and uh, called Waldorf Mars Moss. And it, we had people from NatureServe come out and people from Withers Revenel come out to do a drone flyover. And the idea was that in our scene, it was an accurate depiction of this longleaf pine forest. However, it didn't include accurate placement. And so what we wanted to do is we really wanted this visualization to be an embodiment of the data. And so after flying over a uh, drone, we were able to get a LIDAR scan and we cut a trunk slice. If you can see here up at the top, this red area is a trunk slice. And that showed us the placement of all the longleaf pines in that environment. And we were able to completely recreate a landscape using our longleaf pine model and that LIDAR information to create an accurate depiction of the sort of like that whole 200 foot by 200 foot area. And, you know, the idea is that we could advance visualizations to better communicate the ecological knowledge that we have. And so earlier in this, early in the presentations, you saw these uh, biodiversity maps. So the idea was that you could kind of like zoom down into that biodiversity map and kind of Im immerse yourself in the data in, an, in a way that's like tangible and it, and, and it connects you with it. This is the video that we'll show here of kind of like me with a VR headset looking around. Um, I don't know if y'all want to switch to that, if it will be more high quality. So you'll see in this experience that I have the VR headset on and I'm looking around our longleaf pine um, environment. And we wanted to make we wanted the bark to be able to have details so you could walk up to it and look at it really closely. You could pick up things like branches or pine cones to help identify the tree. Um, and with our experts, especially from NC State, they wanted us to involve an element of controlled burning so that the environment, uh, that story element and the importance of that story element in the environment could be depicted. Um, and the idea was that it could be used in an educational context. And we were really proud to have details kind of like showing the endurance of the tree, being able to bend down and look at the, the charring of the bark. Um, and what eventually happens is the uh, fire burns through, it burns back the understory like the, the wire grass and the turkey oaks. Um, and we even have wildflowers that um, come up based off the, the nature serve um, vegetative plot that we did of percent coverage. Pretty happy. Pretty happy with the way it came out. All right, we can stop the video now. Really, I really wish I could put a VR headset on everybody watching right now so they could experience it because it's really incredible. Thanks, Derek. So at Unique Places to Save, while we have a big priority focus on technology and nature, we also have a lot of on the ground work where we incorporate technology and nature. So, um, in partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, we are restoring a site where we need a fat passage for an endangered fish, so we'll be removing a dam. And at the same site, we're also going to be developing a public river access park area. And so we'll be using Nature XR with its biologically accurate assets to show um, project stakeholders, what the site could be like once that dam is removed and we have the restoration in place and even um, some of the assets that uh, folks want to have at their park, like uh, canoe access um, for the river. In addition, we're using it at um, a Tidal Creek restoration site on a NOAA funded project. 
And in this case, this is a heavy restoration project. And again, because it's restoration, our visualization needs to be species accurate. Um, so we're gonna be using NatureR to show that. And what's great is that with NatureXR, we can overcome the fact that this site won't be publicly accessible until it's completed. So we can jump that hurdle. And then we can also jump some of those COVID-19 hurdles where we can't get people in the same room just yet to work on the project, but they'll be able to experience the site before getting out there themselves. Um, our projects, our project partners are really excited about this too. So for example, uh, the American Chestnut Foundation would really like to show how the historic Eastern deciduous forest once looked when they were dominated by the American Chestnut. And the Audubon Society would really love to put a red cockaded woodpecker in that uh, pine savanna that Derek just showed. All right, next slide. So there's a lot of great applications for um, Nature XR. So we can simulate natural resource management best practices for higher education courses and landowner outreach. We can have biologically accurate 3D renderings for landscape architecture, which could help promote use of native species. And we can even incorporate digital assets that represent nature in games and applications that bring that crossover of entertainment and education in apps and games. So we really serve, NatureXR, the purpose is to bridge the gap between tech experts and nature experts. And so what we're doing is building this research and development collaborative um, between these two groups to certify these assets and get them into use. So with that, I'll wrap it up. We hope you will consider joining our collaborative. Um, check us out at naturexr.org to find out more information and hopefully we can take a question or two. Thanks.